Now, the latest World Press Freedom Index has just been published, and it paints a mixed picture of countries across the continent. Reporters Without Borders says the situation in two countries, Egypt and Eritrea, is extremely bad. Egypt is described as one of the world's biggest prisons for journalists, and Eritrea has the second lowest ranking in the world. Only North Korea is worse. Some African countries enjoy guaranteed press freedoms. The report highlights Namibia and South Africa. And Africa's most populous nation, Nigeria, has a rich and diverse media landscape. But Reporters Without Borders says it is one of, the, of West Africa's most dangerous and difficult countries for journalists who are often watched, attacked, arbitrarily arrested, and even killed. Now, in 2020... DW's Conflict Zone spoke to Nigeria's Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed, on the topic of press freedom. Take a listen to what he said. I, I think when it comes to freedom of the press, we're doing extremely very well. If papers run foul of the law, they must face the consequences. But when you have virtually 100 newspapers in the country, and you are citing the example of one newspaper that was closed down in a year, I think it should be fair to us that we have a very robust free press. My next guest is a man who is well pleased to tell us about the state of Nigerian press freedoms. He is one of Nigeria's most talked about investigative journalists. David Hundein, welcome to DW News Africa. Now, we just heard the Nigerian information minister telling DW that the country was doing extremely well when it comes to press freedom. That was two years ago. What's your experience today as an award-winning investigative journalist? My experience is that I've had to flee the country um, for the sake of my own personal safety. If I want to maintain my freedom and possibly my life, I simply cannot be in Nigeria. I currently live under asylum protection in exile in a country that I'm probably not allowed to, to, to name here. So um, my experience has been completely at odds with whatever it is that Lai Mohammed has had to say. And what I will also mention is that even though... Um, we no longer have uh, parcel bombs being delivered to journalists or, you know, uh, journalists getting uh, bullied in the newsrooms by soldiers, uh, you know, wielding AK-47 rifles in their faces. It doesn't mean that Nigeria has a free press in any way. Can you tell us exactly what happened that made you flee? Right. So uh, on the night of October 20, 2020, the uh, Nigerian military carried out a massacre of civilian, unarmed civilian protesters at the Lekito Plaza in Lagos State. Now, I was uh, able to get access to information from the mobile network provider, which was at the center of the Bruhaha, which essentially implicated the Nigerian government uh, in terms of who, it, who was responsible for sabotaging its fiber optic cable infrastructure, because at the okay. exact moment that the massacre took place, people suffered mass uh, internet outages. So... For basically, for putting this story out there, I knew that I was going to potentially risk losing my freedom and or my life. So I fled the country before putting the story out there. But on the face of it, things look good in Nigeria, right? It has one of the most diverse media landscapes on the continent. Uh, the constitution also protects freedom of expression and opinion. Is there nothing to celebrate, you say? So Nigeria has this thing called um, isomorphic mimicry in developmental uh uh, economics. So, which means that on paper, it has all the paraphernalia and appearances of a functioning democratic society. So, as you said, it has constitutional guaranteed freedoms, there's a Freedom of Information Act, a separation of powers, all that good stuff. In practice, the Nigerian government is by far and away the largest media and ad spender in Nigeria, which means that even if they're not pointing a gun in your face, just the simple fact that they wield the purse strings makes it such that people self-censor a lot in the Nigerian media space. So, yeah, they don't need to censor you directly. You will censor yourself if you want to be able to pay, you know, to make payroll next month. Now, your West Africa Weekly goes out on the subscription platform Substack. How much of a game changer are online outlets like this? Um, what they have done is that they have completely democratized the flow of information because the hyper-independence of platforms like West Africa Weekly has placed them completely outside of the zone of influence or control of any Nigerian public or private sector entity. So essentially, 
um, that makes in the Nigerian government's eyes, that makes us very dangerous because West Africa Week, for example, has a subscriber base of just over 21,000 as at last week and a total uh, a global distribution list of in the region of 100,000 plus. So there's a large audience for it. And this is uh, essentially media that is not controlled in any way by okay. the Nigerian government. It's not funded even with money that comes from Nigeria in any way. So that's from the point of view of, of, uh, of uh, uh, objective unbiased press is good news. But from the point of view of the Nigerian government is probably very bad news indeed. So um, you won the 2020 People's Journalism Prize for informed commentary, and you've been a trailblazer for independent media. But you have more enemies than you've won awards, clearly. Uh, do you still have hope that things can change for the better in your home country? Um, yeah, I do. And I think when things will change for the better is when um, more Nigerians develop a sort of political consciousness about what exactly um, the interaction is between things like freedoms and economics and the elections that they participate in very rambunctiously every four years. Because currently there's a sort of disconnect. People don't really seem to be able to link the electoral choices they make with the outcomes like the Lekki massacre or bullying of journalists or, you know, flatlining the economy. So I feel as if as people become more informed, don't forget that the internet is still pretty much a new space in Nigeria. Most Nigerians didn't have basically internet access until maybe around 2010, 2011. So mm. the country is just maybe like a decade old in terms of access to information. So I think over as time goes on, as people mature, as more and more, as Nigerian society becomes more information saturated, I think naturally people's political consciousness will start to evolve and the country okay. will start to make progress kicking and screaming, yes. Okay, David Hundain, investigative journalist in Nigeria. Thank you. Thanks for having me.